and we look around at the world and the things that are happening in this world, we have to understand that God is still on the throne and God is still watching over us because we are part of his creation. Now, this morning's message, I, I titled it as the second coming of Christ by the numbers. The second coming of Christ by the numbers. Now, the holiday of Pesach, 2024, or Passover, and as you can see on the Hebrew calendar, is Nisan 14 to 22. That's the days, their days, 14 to 22. On our calendar, it's, it's slated as Monday, April 22nd, 2024, and it ends on April the 30th of 2024. Now, uh, that other one that's on there, Marie, if you'll click that one off, there's another one on there. That's a yearly Hebrew calendar, and it shows where it's at. I just did the month of uh, uh, April on this one, that first one. You see that other one there at the bottom? Click that one off up there at the top. Exit out. Now there's another one there on the bottom, right above the red one. Yes, click on that one. Now that's the Hebrew calendar, what it looks like. And this over here, that's in parentheses, like it shows us when the uh, uh, Passover is going to be, uh, the month of the year. And we can see there that this is Nisan 1, or the first month of their year. Okay? So with all that is going on in Israel right now, the reason I brought that up, we have Israel did that recent strike on Iran, and the Passover coming up, and when we look at that, it's, um, it would be an ideal time, if you think about it, for Jesus to return. Because this Passover is often called the Festival of Freedom by the Jewish people. Now they could be free from what's happening over there uh, because they celebrate their freedom from the slavery that they was in. Now look at the armies that are encompassed around Jerusalem right now and the things that are happening over in Israel right now. 350 rockets and, and drones just attacked Israel. Israel responded with one uh, on an air base over there in Iran. Now the term from, uh, comes from God, the Passover term comes from God who had the Israelite believers mark their doors of their homes with the blood of the Lamb. And this was to save the firstborn from the worst of God's plagues on Egypt. Now I said believers. I don't believe everybody that was in um, that was over there that were uh, Israelites, I don't believe all of them marked their doors. I believe some of them didn't. And I believe some of them didn't because they didn't believe in God. Because they felt like God had deserted them. They felt like God had left them. And there they was, had been slaves for 400 years. And, 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 and they felt that God had left them out. And we see that when they got there at the bottom of Mount Sinai, when they were still struggling and they didn't want to believe that Moses was even talking to God. So Moses made a statement there. I, all of you people here, and there's where we find Korah doing his thing. He says, all of you that is with me for God come to my side. And all of you that is for Korah go to his side. And the Bible says that God caused an earthquake and it swallowed up all the people that stayed over that didn't come with Moses. So the first two days of Passover are no work allowed, period. But the next four days are Flor Hamad, which work is allowed, but it has some restrictions about how much work you can do. And so during this whole week, will Iran come at them again? Think about that. This would be an ideal time for Iran to attack Israel again. And what are Israel going to do? This is not the end of the uh, end of Israel, and it's not the end of time, because in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 6, Jesus himself speaking, he says, 
and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. See, don't be af afraid of it. And that's the way they're doing over there. They're not afraid of whatever's happening. He says, don't be afraid, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So we know that this is not going to be the end of the world. And so there may be some people out there that's going to try to tell you that it is, but understand, it's probably not. Now Jesus has always existed, even before the world was made. He took on human flesh, and he lived with us for a period of time. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says, According as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now how can we who have been sinful of our whole, my whole life I've been a sinner. How could I ever be thinking about being holy, you see? And that right away, that puts markers up for people to say, that's a red flag for me because I know I've been bad. I know I'm still being bad in a lot of things I do. So how could I ever be holy? You see, and so that's where it comes in. Trust in God with all your heart. <coughs> and, and say, Lord, forgive me. I've been such a mess all my life. Well, Jesus came the first time at his virgin birth. And that was the beginning of his earthly ministry. And this earthly ministry ended at his cross with his ascension into heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And so he came here, <coughs> not just for the people that was living back then, but for us today as well. And so we're here now trying to figure out how God has done all these things. And yet He's given us some clues to understanding some of the harder things for us to see. And this is going to be very hard for you to understand. Now some of this is going to be over your head. I'm, I'm sure of it. Not, without a doubt in my mind, some of it's going to be over your head. But just don't throw it away. Just hang on to it. Treat it like you do fish, you know. You sit there and you eat your fish, right? But some of it might seem like it's bones. But it may not be bones. It may be just a little too hard. So just hang on to it. And later on, maybe God will open your eyes and you'll see what some of this stuff is about. And so God shows us some things even in words and numbers. And He showed us more and more things as we, uh, we look around. But we know that His second coming will be at the end of the age. We do know that. And we do know that He's going to establish His earthly kingdom here for a thousand years. The Bible says He's going to put Satan in a bottomless pit and bound him there for a thousand years. We read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Verse 2, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed for a little season. And so the devil's going to be bound for a thousand years, and then God's going to test mankind again. And after this thousand years, the Bible said it's going to be people as the sand of the sea. They have lived with Christ for a thousand years, and they're going to leave Christ and go back with the devil. And I just don't see how that's possible. But it, read the Bible. That's what it says. They're going to leave Christ in the numbers like the sand of the sea. And because he's going to rule with a rod of iron. There's a lot of people that's come to church today and they don't want to continue in church. Oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And, oh, I hate this and I don't like that. and All this sort of thing. When he rules and reigns for a thousand years, you're definitely probably not going to like that either then, are you? Not if you don't want to get right with God and do the right thing. So we need to make up our minds today. I'm going to do whatever God says, come what may. I don't care what God... What the world has to say, I'm going to do what God's telling me to do. 
And, 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 and then Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 16, He says, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Now how long is forever? Think about that. How long is forever? That He may abide with you forever. So that may part, then uh, you have something to do with that, because you might want to drive Him off, or you might want to quench the Spirit, or you might not as Say, well, I'm not going to do what God said. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. He says in verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth within you, and shall be with you. You see, he's talking to people who are Christian, in a way, but they're in Christians such a way that they are children of God. Not all Christians are children of God. That's just a title. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me because I live, and you shall live also. He that has my commandments, see there? He that has my commandments, and keeps them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. And so, God wants us to be holy, and he knows that we've sinned. But he says, you know what? You need to start doing the right thing. If you're really serious about wanting to get right with God, and, and getting your life right, and doing the right thing, I'm going to help you. So he says, the, in the Hebrew it's called the Rosh HaKadosh, or the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit fell on the believers in the fulfillment of the promise given by our Lord Himself. And it occurred according, right precisely on the calendar, according to the Word of God. If you'll turn with me to Leviticus 23, and I'll show you. We have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost simply means 50 days. Pente being 50 and the cost part being days. So that's, that's all Pentecost means, is 50 days. And he says in Leviticus 23, verse 15, And you shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath, from the day that you were brought, you brought the sheep of the wave offering. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number fifty days. You see there? Shall you number fifty days, day of Pentecost. And you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Well, that occurred after the cross. And Jesus had told us in Acts chapter 1, just before he went up to heaven, he says, but ye, in verse 8, he says, but ye shall receive power... After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now the Holy Spirit did come down in Acts chapter 2. And it was like cloven tongues standing upon all those that were in the house. And they was all speaking all kinds of different languages. And so the Holy Spirit came down just as it was promised. Jesus says, as the days of Noah was, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And so, all the promises are going to be fulfilled. The promise of this Holy Spirit was fulfilled in. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So all of us, whether we're Jew or Gentile, we all have the Holy Spirit if we are all believers in God, in Christ. We are all of one, one Spirit, one, one, one. We are in unity. We now know there has been a difference because why? How do you know there's been a difference in you? Because now you have the Holy Spirit in you. And you can look back upon your life and say, well, I may not be where I want to be. But look where I used to be. I'm not like I was before. And so there has been a change in me. 
I can see it myself. And other people have seen it. And they say, boy, there's been a real change in you. And now we have these Christian nationalists out there. Uh, the ones that are trying to get Donald Trump elected. Uh, they need some man to be their leader. Why do they need some man? Is it because they don't have the Holy Spirit? You see, we have the Holy Spirit, and what else do we need? Because God is, is our leader, and He's telling us how He wants us to do so. If these Christian nationalists don't have the Holy Spirit, then how can they be born again? You see, they can't be. They're just Christian. Now, there were German nationalists, and what did the German nationalists do? They got Hitler elected into power. And Hitler ruled like an iron fist, didn't he? And look at the turmoil he'd done in the whole world. And it was Christian nationalists that got him there. The same, they were called German nationalists. They were Christian German nationalists, just like American nationalists are today. In Psalms 2, he says, Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, verse 2, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, cast their cords away from us. But look at verse 4. Read that, Marie. Are you there yet? Hey, Psalms, what, what Psalms 2, verse 4. Okay, just one second. The reason I want her to read it, I don't want somebody to think I'm, I'm coming up with something else here. Because it, some people might say, God wouldn't do nothing like that. He's just saying that. So read it. He that said it in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You see there? God's going to laugh at some of these people when they have all these problems. Nuclear bombs are going to be falling. And you're going to think, oh God, help me. And he's going <laughs> to Think about that. Because right now God is calling all men to repentance. But this is fixing to change. We're fixing to be done with the age of the Gentiles. We're fixing to be done with this age that we're in, the Christian church. Because they have not done the job that God appointed them to do. The, the, the church was to go out and evangelize the world, but the world evangelized the church. And so the church is worshiping God on Sunday, which is a, an abomination to God. Because God says to keep my holy Sabbath. Do not break my commandments. Do what I'm telling you. And so he says he's going to laugh at them. And then he says in verse 5, Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And then he says, Yet I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And so again we see in Isaiah chapter 9, we're talking about the Messiah coming again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who is that individual it's talking about here? Some passages have described him as a suffering servant. Like in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1. He says, Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord displayed? Or revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So even a homosexual is not going to like the looks of Jesus. So don't tell me how nice he looks and all that because the Bible has declared he has no form or comeliness that anyone would desire him. I don't want to be like him, they're going to think. So he was not what you see in these pictures. pictures. He did not have long hair. He did not look like this impressive gentleman. According to the Word of God, he is despised, verse 3, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely, verse 4, 
He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So they all thought he was being beat up by God because he was a bad person maybe, huh? But he was wounded, the Bible says differently then, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And then he says in verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. This is what God wanted. God wanted Jesus to go to the cross and die for the sin of the whole world. This is what God wanted. And so we understand from the New Testament that only one single individual is in view. He is shown to us in different ways. One, at his first coming, he's a suffering servant. But at his second coming, as I've just read, at his second coming, he's going to be a victorious king who is going to reign for eternity. The Bible has never pictured him coming in what some have called a secret rapture. This has been brought to our attention by some unrepentant sinners trying to get by or not wanting to be found out in their sin, so maybe God will hurry up and rapture us out of here and nobody will notice that we still haven't quit sinning and doing what we've been doing. And so as we study the Old Testament, we can see Jesus is pictured in every story, in every passage, in every event. And Jesus himself said in John chapter 5 and verse 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they, were, they which testify of me. So the Bible talks about Jesus, cover to cover. We're thoroughly taught by the Word of God when the Lord will return. Now I've covered the message on that, why the rapture hasn't happened and when it will happen. It's on the YouTube channel if you want to go back and look at it sometime. So when He will return and how it will all go down. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now sleep in Jesus, now that could mean they're, they're asleep, or it could mean that they are in Jesus totally, right there. They're in heaven with Jesus. For this is, we say to you, unto you by the word of the Lord, in verse 15, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent. And that word prevent is an old King James word of saying precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The coming is described by different views. And these different views that these uh, many so-called Bible scholars today are numerous, and they're not, in fact, what the Bible plainly teaches. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, again, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. You see, we shall not all sleep. It means we're not all going to die before the Lord returns. But we shall all be changed. And how's it going to happen? He said it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sounding of the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this, verse 53 Corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus knew that some people would pervert his words to tickle someone's ears. Jesus knew this. So he told us exactly how and when the rapture would happen. And I'm going to read that to you now. How it would go down. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we've heard already that 
the, the things that are going to happen to precede the rapture and how it's going to go down overall. Like God gave us a picture of the of the Bible in, in Genesis chapter 1 and he said this is how he created it. He goes in chapter 2 and he outlines it in detail how his creation was put together. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you brethren. Now we're trying to, our word beseech you, that means listen, we're trying to really tell you what the truth is here. And so don't listen to these people that are telling you all this other stuff. We beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him that you soon that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as the day of Christ is at hand don't listen to what all these people saying to you that's what he's saying here listen to what I'm telling you just like I've told you in times past, I'm telling you again. Listen to me, is what he's saying here. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And who is it? Verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now Jesus isn't going to come back and just said so plainly right there until this happens. Now you can, you can say, well, this man said this, and this pastor said that, and this teacher said this. But if he did not say what the Word of God said, he's wrong. Maybe he doesn't know he's wrong. Maybe he's listened to someone else and he's just drawing conclusion from what he's been taught in one of these cemetery, uh, seminaries. More like cemeteries, but seminaries. Because they're only teaching dead things. They're not teaching people the truth. They're not teaching the Word of God. They're teaching something else. They're teaching what makes them get along with their congregation. Does God give proof? when the rapture will occur. Well, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus speaking again, He says in, in this um, Olivet Discourse, what this is called, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So now, does the Bible give proof when it's going to happen? He says, you're not going to know when He's coming back. Isn't that what He says? Nobody's going to know. Verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying. You know, if they thought that Jesus was fixing to come back anytime soon, would they have all left the churches? Wouldn't they still be in the churches just like they was in the year 2000? when they thought it was going to be the end of the world? But look at the people today that have left the churches and aren't having anything to do with God. And he says, just like they were eating and drinking, in verse 38, marrying and giving in marriage until that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. You know what? He says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now this would be an ideal time for the Lord to come back. Because they don't know He's coming. They don't know so much that they don't even care. They've left the churches. They're doing whatever they want to do. And they can, oh, I can make it all by myself. I don't need God. Yeah, I'll do whatever I want to do. Ain't nobody can tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. Remember, in the context here, of pointing us to the flood of Noah's day as well as the destruction of the world at the end time in the book of Peter uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 he tells us beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day which means with God time is nothing that's simply all that it means. Time is nothing. You can take that and, and you can make all kind of different religious ceremonies out of it and say it means this and it means that, but 
Many years ago, people tried to declare that they learned from the Bible when Jesus would return. Now, how, and a good friend of mine, uh, who recently passed away, Brother Camping, he was wrong. He, de he declared when Jesus was going to return. He declared when the judgment was going to be. And he declared that with the numbers that he read. And, uh, and the things he compared to in the Bible. And he figured out dates. And the Bible says no man knows. Not even Jesus knows. And so how could Harold Camping have known? See, he couldn't. <coughs> and so Harold was wrong but then we have people that they say the rapture is imminent that's also a date and isn't it it's fixing to happen any minute now that's also a date so we got to watch ourselves but just before the flood Noah was instructed by God in seven days the flood would begin Noah built the ark God put him inside the ark and then in verse 7 it says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, for forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. This is God talking now in here. And then in verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days. You know, God says, look, they built this ark, and they've taken all these years to get it done, and there's a flood coming. Now, y'all can get into this ark here and you can be saved. All you have to do is believe. And how many got into that ark with Noah? Not one individual. Not one person got in that ark with Noah other than the ones that, his family, that was already there. Why? They had a warning. And the Bible says they knew not. Come on now. They knew not. And yet God called them over and over and over and told them. How is it they knew not? Isn't God calling us today the same way? Isn't God doing the same thing with us today? And yet people are going to say they knew not about the people today as well. Think about it. It came to pass after seven days, verse 10, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. When did it happen? In the 600th year of Noah's life. In the second month, the 17th day of the month. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So it tells us exactly when it happened. Now, we don't have a calendar back then, but we can figure it out by, by figuring out when Noah was born. And they've done just that. The rain was upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 13, And the self same day entered Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. So some of the Bible scholars started using this thing that Second Peter had to say. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. But they failed to see that God used Noah, who was a preacher, of righteousness to declare that mankind had only seven days. He wasn't saying 7,000 years. And they've made that like 7,000 years to escape destruction. And now there's a theory out there that the rapture has to happen very soon now because we've come 7,000 years. But according to the, uh, the Jewish calendar, it goes back to 57, whatever. I've got it on that calendar there. We're not nowhere close to 7,000 years. On this uh, calendar that's being used in America is different from the Hebrew calendar. So we're nowhere close to it. But in Second Peter chapter 5, he says, He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. There's no chapter 5 in Second Peter. Chapter 2, verse 5. Did I say chapter 5? Yes, you did. Well, I stumbled then, didn't I? I'm good at stumbling. I'm glad you're keeping me in check. <laughs> you know, whatever. 
But they say since this time to that time, they have calculated that precisely 7,000 years after Noah preached that warning, God has given mankind proof when the rapture will occur. But then they all keep changing these dates. And what they say doesn't line up with the Jewish calendar. But God in His mercy has given His creation a lot of time to repent. That's what they're missing. The key word is repent. And God's saying you need to repent before this happens or else you're going to be taken away. And they're missing that part. They're, they're missing the whole concept of why God's waiting. Today is the Hebrew day and they call it the Shabbat, S-H-A-B-B-A-T, or the Sabbath. Saturday is the month of Nisan, and the day is the twelfth, according to the Hebrew calendar. And the year is 5784. Now that's a long way from 7,000. I don't know how these um, Julian or uh, Gregorian calendars got so far away, but they're an awful long way from 5784 thinking it's been 7,000. And so anyway, this, today is April the 20th, 2024, on that old Roman calendar that Americans go by. And I can bring, can bring up them calendars again if you want to look at them. Now the Sabbath foreshadows the, what they call Olam Habath, or the world to come. And that world to come is, uh, is to restore our dignity as children of the new covenant under the Messiah. That's what the Sabbath is all about. It's not about, I don't know what people have got the Sabbath worked up to be, but it's a covenant that God had made in the Old Testament, even for the people in the New Testament. And this covenant is in the Hebrew word, Olam Haba. Our world to come. And our world to come is under the rule of the Messiah. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron. What difference does that make? If God said to do something and you're going to do it, what difference does it make to you if he's ruling with a rod of iron? What difference is it if the speed limit is 40 miles an hour out there going through Pine Road and you're doing 35 or 40? Makes no difference to you then, does it? But if you're doing 70 or 80, then it makes a difference, doesn't it? Because something could happen to you for doing the wrong thing, then couldn't it? So God wants us to do the right thing. Be holy. Get right with Him. But today men think they've learned the precise date of the cross. And they date the cross as April the 1st, 33 A.D. Isn't that something? But when coordinated with our present calendar... They've come up with yet another date. <laughs> and how many of them has ever been right? There's been bunches of dates being set when Christ is the return, but none of them have been right so far. <laughs> and so, <coughs> excuse me, just as their dates are always wrong, so is the concept of the rapture. And see, and most of the people that's doing this are supposed to be Bible scholars. And so why are they doing this? When they know they've made mistakes and they do this, that, and the other, yet they continue to do what the Bible says not to do. No man's going to know the day or the hour when the Lord comes back. So why do they keep doing it for? Said so even the Son didn't know. There are some names and numbers in the Bible that can convey a spiritual truth. I'm going to cover some of that stuff with you today. And they may shed some light. But will they tell us when the rapture or the second coming of Jesus will be? Because the Bible said again in Mark chapter 13 now, verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. I mean, that's pretty plain. Only, only God knows when it's going to happen. So how does some man think he can figure it out? If Jesus could have couldn't figure it out. Because <laughs> he said he didn't know. Then how's some man going to figure it out? Now Jesus walked on water. How many men do you see walking on water? <coughs> God sometimes uses words or numbers in such a way to convey a spiritual truth. Even though it may not be apparent in the literal usage of these words or numbers. For example, the word lamb 
frequently points to Christ as a Lamb of God. Okay, now most people know that already. The word mountain now often signifies kingdom. Field signifies a world. And blood signifies Christ giving his life. Jerusalem often signifies the kingdom of God. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. But still, Jesus said that no man was to know the day the Lord would return but the Father. As we go through this, think about what you have heard and think about what you've been doing. Couldn't Jesus have figured it out if he had wanted to? Maybe, maybe not. But the Bible says no man knows, not even Jesus. So let us look at some of these numbers. And as we can focus on some of the numbers. When the Bible talks about Christ being crucified, we see the number three. It's featured several times. We have three crosses. There was three crosses at Calvary, wasn't there? Three apostles in the garden with Jesus right before he was captured. There were three denials by Peter. And so what do all these threes mean? Or are they just emphasizing that it was God's purpose for Christ and what was going to be happening to him? <coughs> In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And so, Jesus said, now one thing to consider this. Numbers do mean something. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, and verse 30, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. <laughs> Think about that. Why would, he, why would Jesus have to have our hair numbered? He don't have as many to count on Mark now. <laughs> or me. <laughs> But he, does, he knows how many we have. Why is that number so important to God? Why, we, think, we don't think that way though, do we? <laughs> when you lose one of our hair, oh well, I lost another hair. Well, you don't even know when you lost it. So I, you look up one day, there's a big bald spot there. Well, I'm not, I don't know. I must have lost it. It's gone somewhere. So obviously, some of these numbers, we should carefully consider what we do with them. As we look at some, are they just random, by chance, or something else? Like one. One, the number one is easily seen to represent absolute singleness or unity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. And then Jesus says in John 17, 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and that the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. So one definitely must mean unity. And some people say it means solidarity, or whatever. <laughs> two, number two now represents all of God's creation, I think. Male and female, hot and cold. God's Word, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Law, the Prophets. Everything you look at, it, 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 it is, has an exact opposite, good and bad, male and female, hot and cold, you name it. Everything has a, an exact opposite. So two represents all of God's creation. Three represents the Godhead Trinity. The angels have cry holy, holy, holy three times to a triune God. Isaiah chapter 6. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 
1 John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are three, <coughs> there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. <coughs> and there, <coughs> verse 8, And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now if you've got another a version or a perversion of the Bible, then them words are not in it. They're only in the King James Bible. Now three and a half represents rejection and apostasy. It is the dissection of seven. It's half of seven. God's perfect number. So when you cut God's perfect number in half, you get apostasy because you're only going to be doing half of what God says. And we see a lot of Christians, I say Christians, not children of God now, we see a lot of Christians doing that very same thing. Three and a half years, Elijah fled from persecution. Jesus was crucified at the end of a three and a half year ministry. Stephen was the first Christian martyr, stoned at the end of three and a half years of the apostles preaching in persecution. The half represents people who are never filled, but always half full, half learned, half a man, half a woman. Always sure of what God wants us to be. Kind of like King Agrippa said, well, I'll look at you another time. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And a lot of other people like him. Almost, but not all in. Like people that miss more church than they come. It represents, four represents testing. Testing, four. Think about that for a minute. Earth, creation, world, whether it is 4 or 40 or any number of zeros on it. 40 also represents a generation and times of testing, probation, judgment. It rained for 40 days during the flood. Moses spent 40 years in the desert. He spent 40 years in Egypt. He spent 40 years at Mount Sinai. 40 years. Jesus fasted for 40 days in, and then we have the four directions, north, south, east, and west. We also have the four winds. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from what? The four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. <coughs> so, four is a number of testing. Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And so we go on to five, is grace, God's number for grace. That's the day he created the animals. The cross, the atonement, the light, the animals were all made on the fifth day. We are not the same as the animals, humans, people, because we are part of the sixth day creation, not the fifth day. So don't try to let the devil make an animal out of you. It's impossible. You'd, the most you could be is some sort of a hybrid. Man was created on the sixth day, and so this is man's number. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image. Let us, you see that? Make man in our image image. So there's more than one. That's a three. Triune God in our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And so the number of man represents the worship of man and his rebellion his works, his imperfections, his disobedience. And it is used 273 times in the Bible, incidentally. Exodus chapter 31, verse 15. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign, now listen to this, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel. Now what did I say a while ago about us being 
one body. And being a born again child of God, you are a Jew. A Jew is not a Jew who is a Jew outwardly, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Well, in a born again child of God, we are children of Abraham. We are children of, that God calls his children. And it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Seven represents perfection, completeness. The Bible number is a sign of God. Divine worship, completions, obedience, and rest. In Revelation there are seven churches, seven spirits, seven golden candlesticks, seven stars, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven heads, seven crowns, seven last plagues, seven golden vows, seven mountains, seven kings, and seven days in a week. Think about that now. <laughs> eight represents Jesus and a new beginning. And on the eighth day he was raised from the dead. And on the eighth were saved in the flood. There was only eight souls that were in the ark with Noah. Counting himself. There was eight of them. Nine is God's number for fruit. Now we find this in the ninth book of the New Testament. Who knows what the ninth book of the New Testament is? Galatians, count them up. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Come on, Marie, count them up. Tell us. The ninth book of the New Testament is Galatians. Okay, so what about the fruit? We find the fruit in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. He says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. And then verse 23 says, Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. But then you say that's chapter 5 and verse 22. So 5 and 2 is 7 and 2 is 9. You see, there is 9 again, isn't it? And then we find, oh, no, it's got two verses there, verses 22 and verses 23. So 2 and 2 is 4 and 2 is 6 and 3 is 9 again, isn't it? Boy, what a coincidence all that makes, huh? Isn't that awesome? Boy, I've never seen such coincidence. Place in Galatians is 5, 22, and 23, as I said. Now, what if you take, if you take two... Um, what is one times nine? That's nine, right? What is two times nine? And if you add the eight and the one, what do you have? Nine. All right, how about three times nine? What is that? Seven. And you add the seven and the two, and what do you have? What if you take, uh, I don't know, say uh, nine? Nine times nine is eighty-one. And eight and one is nine. Why is that? How about uh, seven then? Seven times nine is sixty-three. Now, how much is the six and three? Nine. Nine again. So any number that you multiply nine by. When you reduce it down like we have, it doesn't matter which number you want to pick. Though. Pick any number you want. 99. Okay? 9 times 99. When you reduce it down and, bring, and, and add it all up again, it will always come out to 9. Now why is that? Because that's the fruit. And he, put a, he told us what the fruit of the Spirit was. You see? And God wants His fruit to stand. So let's read that verse again, Marie. In Galatians chapter... Five. Uh, which, 22, which one? Verse 23. Make this temperance against much there is no law. There is no law. And does it say anything else there? In verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and lusts. You see there? Why would he say that? Giving us nine different fruits of the Spirit. No, not nine different fruits, but nine different uh, uh, nine different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Because there's only one Spirit. You see? And so there's nine different manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit. But the beginning of the fruit of the Spirit is what? 
The beginning of it is love, isn't it? And if we don't have if we don't have love, then what do we have? Also we look in the numbering system we have today. Like I said, nine times five is forty five. Four and five is nine. And every I got them all listed up here on my chart here, so <coughs> excuse me. Any number times nine and add it down will always come out to nine. So why may you ask? In John chapter fifteen, verse sixteen, Jesus answers that question. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He wants us to realize, and he's given us this numbering system to prove. He wants us to realize he has made fruit for us. He's given us this fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And when we exercise this fruit, that He's given us and live by this fruit that He's given us, we're going to make a difference. But the problem is people's not making a difference because they're not using the fruit of the Spirit. They're using their own self. Now number 10 denotes completion. Well, completion like 10 fingers. Completeness, finality, fullness, 10 toes. Also God's numbering system, 1 to 10. As well as the Ten Commandments. Why not Eleven Commandments? Why not Twelve Commandments? Why Ten? Num number Eleven is incompleteness. Disorganization. Disintegration. It can't agree with anything because it has no unity. Eleven disciples were in agreement. But one was a traitor. The fallen one. One of apostasy. The one of perdition. Twelve represents completed works. Not completion, but completed works, like the twelve months in a year. Divine government, apostolic fullness, the twelve months of the year, as I said. And Jesus had twelve disciples, twelve tribes of Israel. The New Jerusalem city has twelve foundations, twelve gates. It was twelve thousand furlongs wide, twelve thousand furlongs long, twelve thousand furlongs high. A tree... It has a tree with 12 kinds of fruit 12 times a year. <laughs> so many people have taken these verses out of context. And they want to use these things, these numbers. And they want to use these numbers so they can say whatever. And they can say, well, the Lord's coming back because I figured it out because of these numbers here. But is the Lord coming back because they figured it out? Really? Remember I said, remember that word repent? In Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, when Jesus began His ministry, when He first began to preach, in Matthew 4 verse 17, Marie, please. Okay. Um, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so they're missing the whole point. Does it really matter when the Lord's coming back? Does it really matter? If you're a born again child of God this morning, does it matter that the Lord comes back tomorrow or next month? Because you know as a born again child of God that God's going to protect you. He's going to supply all your needs. So what difference does it make if you're in heaven or you're here on this earth? When we, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say as in heaven, so is it is on earth. Thy Lord, thy will be done. So on earth as it is in heaven. And so why don't we look at what we're doing as children of God and understand? What difference does it make when He comes back? The only difference it makes is for the people who are not ready. It's going to be a bad thing for them if they're not ready. Is God using this to force people to get ready? I don't think so. But everything has a beginning that we know of. And everything that we know of has an end. 
there's a, there's a beginning of your birth. And the day that you're born, God says, I'm giving you the day that you're going to die. It is appointed. Once to die and after this, the judgment. So the day that you're born, you come here with a date that you're going to die. Isn't that awesome? And you're going to meet that appointment time. And you may say, well, so-and-so this happened and so-and-so that happened. Did it? Or was it right on God's time? Right on God's, as, we, as Marie sang that song up there, I had my eyes closed and I was thinking, and I, and I could see some of the people that were in this church here. It was like they was on that sea of glass, raising their hands. And I really thought I seen Dar this morning. <laughs> and I just, Lord, what is going on here? You know, we need to realize it ain't about us. You know, don't let your sin take you to hell. Don't let, don't let sin just override your whole self and take you away from God. He's the most important thing that you will ever encounter in this life. And if you're in, if you're in the arms of the Lord, that's the safest place you can be. Amen. Nothing can happen to you. If, you. if you are a child of God, God is not going to let anything happen. You may lose your life. But whoever loses his life shall gain it. That's what Jesus said. He said, if you lose your life for my sake, you will gain it. All these people trying to preserve their lives and trying to get this and trying to do that in this world. And what are they going to get them? What shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So that's one of the things I think we need to look at. Not being so concerned when the Lord's coming back, but being accepted by Him. Are we accepted by Him? A lot of people think they can just come to church and God has to accept them. But He doesn't. He accepts us on the basis of us doing what we're supposed to be doing. Just like we accept Him on the basis, if He's not going to save us, why would we want to accept Him? What good is He to us then if He can't do something for us? And so maybe He feels the same way about us. Why, are, why do we think we're so much so special and more than what God is Himself? But believing in this numbering system, it's hard to deny, as I just showed you some of the things that's in it. It exists, there's no doubt about that. But the Bible says to believe on Jesus. And why believe on Jesus? Well, today there's a numbering system. About three sixes. <laughs> Isn't that awesome, see? And the devil wants you to believe in something and, 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 and not see this numbering system that he's involved in. And if you take his mark, that would be no help for you. Because once you take his mark, it's not just the three sixes we're looking at. Whosoever receiveth his name, pull that verse up, Marie. Revelation chapter 13. Scroll down to uh, verse 16. And we're going to close here this morning. Once you receive the devil's mark, where's that going to leave you at? Hellbound. That's right. And there's no getting out of it, is there? I got it. Let's look at this verse. Verse 16. He causes all. Now how many is not all? All is all. That's everybody then, yeah. isn't it? All, small and great, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive a mark. Either in their right hand or in their forehead. And he says a mark. He didn't say three sixes. He says he's, they receive a mark. And then he goes on, verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Oh, so you've just been concerned about three sixes. But there's more to it, isn't there? And if you don't have Jesus, how are you going to know what you're doing? Without the Holy Spirit, how are you going to know? God, what well, why don't you tell me? Is that going to be the time that He's going to laugh at you in your derision? Remember Psalms 2? Because you rejected Him your whole life, and now you don't know what to do. Because you've been evil and you've said nothing. Lord, I don't want nothing to do with you. 
your whole life, but I don't want to go to hell. I don't want nothing to do with you, but I don't want to go to hell. Think about it. Look at the people who are rejecting Jesus Christ today, yet they don't want to go to hell. What's God going to do with them? You don't want to do what He says. What can He help? What else is there for Him to do with you? There's only two places to go after this life is gone. Heaven or hell. And God says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. So who are you going to serve? Who's going to be your God? Is God going to be your God? Or is the devil going to be your God? Think about that for a minute. Do you want the devil to be your God? There's a numbering system, isn't there? Is it going to tell you? And these people are using this same kind of stuff to get all these figures and numbers up, and they're always wrong. They have never been right. Unless the world ended and we didn't know about it. Unless Jesus came back already and we're all in hell right now and we don't even know it. But hell's supposed to be a place of fire and torment and burning. And I ain't felt none of that. I never will because I'm not going to hell. My Lord and my God is going to take care of me. Is He going to take care of you? Ask yourself that because we're going to have altar call now. Will you come... And say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I want to do everything as you say. Whatever your word says, Lord, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Lord, your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. Lord, help me to walk in the ways that you'd want me to walk. Help me to do the things that you'd want me to do. And Lord, I'll be ever so thankful. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Marie, would you give us a song of invitation? Will you come? Thank you.